Hello, today we will be solving the study prior in it's a neurology question bank just to have a glimpse idea about the questions that uh, we face in neurology. So a uh, first question is a 40 years old gentleman presents with emergency department with a left sided weakness. Blood vision, neck pain for about last two days. His, uh, the left-sided weakness is of a sudden onset immediately preceding by right-sided neck pain. So you can see there is left-sided weakness with right-sided neck pain. Okay. If we are uh, having a scenario that typically says about the uh, weakness in uh, left side or right side with opposite side and neck pain, we should uh, think about the, some conditions like the uh, carotid dissection or vertebral dissection. These things should be kept in mind. But issue is that in case of carotid dissection, the weakness is must be associated with some cause corona syndrome. So there could be association with corona syndrome. In case of uh, vertebral dissection, that might be having association with like the feature of lateral medullary syndrome. Okay, so you we are getting the right sided neck pain, also left sided weakness, and uh, also there is some horner syndrome. As, as we can clearly see, there is right sided ptosis and right sided pupil. So horner, right sided neck pain with weakness. So most likely it is a carotid dissection, most likely. Okay, so the uh, temperature is um, 36.4, the respiratory rate is 18, the um, pulse uh, blood pressure is uh, okay, I, I could say, and there is no pulse. Uh, the WBC count is okay, it's normal, uh, the CRP is also normal. Now CT scan. CT scan demonstrate the hypointensity in the high frontal region that is keeping the possibility of acute ischemic stroke. And the most important thing is CT and geogram from the aortic arch, narrow eccentric lumen in the right internal carotid artery with crescent shaped mural thrombus, finding consistent with right internal carotid artery dissection. So there is no evidence of intra or extracranial aneurysm. So what will be the most important? management plan so I, I i guess it is a bit peculiar question uh we have to do a lot of things the most important thing is that there is a trial which i know from the answer of obviously it shows that the antiplatelet and anticoagulant therapy for about last three to six months okay bingo the can the candice trial the published in uh, 2015 found that no difference between in efficacy between the antiplatelet and anticoagulant in preventing stroke stroke and death in patient with symptomatic carotid and vertebral artery dissection so if we have a patient with carotid and vertebral artery dissection we can uh, treat uh, the patient with antiplatelet or anticoagulant whatever we like that no difference okay uh, the vascular intervention uh, the, uh, the vascular intervention as usually reserved for the recurrence of symptoms that is most important so the next question a 41 years old woman presents to the department with transient expressive dysphagia and right sided paresthesia she described the symptoms as sudden onset easing off of a period of time out of period out of 150 minutes with complete resolution. So it's a TIL like features. Uh, and uh, she is normal transitive, non-smoker and a healthy body weight and uh, quite aware of lipid levels. So there is no problem of dyslipidemia. So for the first two to three years, uh, he, she had a similar symptoms for a few occasions. So similar symptoms, that is recurrence. Since the age of 22, she reports occasional migraines and visual aura. So uh, we, I think we got a diagnosis here. If we patient having a migraine, visual aura, recurrence of a stroke, we need to choose another two perspective. Another thing is cognitive impairment. Yes, she has cognitive issues and the family history. Her mother also treated for multiple sclerosis because of frequent transient neurological symptoms for a number of uh, years. So it's like uh, her daughter also. So the mother is having the frequent neurological syndrome with dementia, with migraines. So typical history. It should not be multiple sclerosis. The whole condition is catacyl. The cerebral autosomal, autosomal dominant infract and leukoencephalopathy, subcortical infract and leukoencephalopathy. So I guess the diagnosis is clear. We should do a notch three mutation. As you can see, uh, the carotid doppler, no stenosis, MRI of brain flare, T2 hyperintensity in the anterotemporal lobe with external capsule relief, uh, sparing of the occipital and orbital frontal subcortical white matter. So. The most important thing is that we should do a genetic test and look for the mutation in the NOST region. 
Okay, so it is cerebral autosomal dom dominant arteriopathy with subcortical infarctant leukoencephalopathy. There must be history of recurrent migraine with aura, particularly in second, third decade of life. There must be associated with stroke, TIA, or cognitive difficulty that must be runs in family. It's autosomal dominant. So there must be family history. So not three gene, as I said earlier, in the chromosome 19. Um, this question. I, I, I like to avoid it. Uh, the next question is, a 66 years old gentleman admitted to stroke ward with transient right-sided weakness, expressive dysphagia, and right-sided facial drooping. Okay, so the weakness involving the right side of the body, also right-sided facial nerve problem. Uh, this must be upper motor type, I, as I guess the uh, considering the weakness is transient with expressive dysphagia. So the lesion must be involving the, uh, I guess, MCA territory. And uh, the symptoms of a sudden onset lasting for 25 minutes with a complete resolution. So it's TIA. Uh, and uh, the history of high blood pressure, hypercholesterolemia, obesity, and smoking. So there's a lot of risk factor. Uh, as you can see, the neurological examination at the time of admission is normal. So neurological having is normal at the time of examination. As you can see, there's a hypertension, heart rate, saturation is all right, Hi only, only hypertensive. The patient is diagnosed with right-sided TIA and uh, right side the ti as yes the right sided weakness is there mri mri uh, mri is not compatible with that so it's tia so we should do a carotid doppler as we can see the right sided internal carotid artery is uh, a bit normal 25 to 30 percent but left internal carotid 80 to 85 percent so that is compatible with the weakness as the left internal carotid artery supplies the right left side of the cortex so there might be if any troubles there. So right-sided weakness could be explained by this lesion. So what is the most next step of investigation? So there is two fact here, as we can see, uh, carotid CT or MR angiography to confirm the diagnosis. Uh, the left internal carotid stents is asymptomatic. Uh, it should not be the answer. So uh, whenever we are having a lesion in the carotid Doppler, we, we are suspecting, we need to confirm it by carotid uh, CT or MR angiography to confirm the carotid Doppler findings. As the patient is having left uh, internal carotid artery lesion, so we need to confirm it by carotid CT or MR angiography to confirm the diagnosis. So the diagnosis will be the A, okay? So in patient with suspected internal carotid artery stenosis, it is reasonable to perform a carotid Doppler in the first investigation in patients with more than 50% symptomatic stenosis in right carotid Doppler should be followed by non-invasive method like CT or MR angiography depending upon the patient's characteristics. So it's a, it's a quite simple question. The patient is having a calculia, or dyscalculia, agraphia, right to left disorientation, and finger agonesia. So it's a typical dominant parietal lesion. So it's, I, uh, I guess it's judgment syndrome. Okay. So the correct answer is dominant parietal lobe because it's a judgment syndrome. And uh, uh, the other features of parietal lobe, particularly inferior homonymous quadrantopia, as the lesion is opposite. If we need to involve the parietal lobe, the lesion will be inferior homonymous quadrantopia and the lesion is temporal of if the lesion will be superior homonymous quadrantopia. Also, the patient is having neglect, astrodiagnosis, and apraxia. The neglect should be visual special, should be the non-dominant perspective. Okay, no need for that. Uh, now, the patient is having weakness in the dense right-sided weakness with its speech dis disturbance. She uh, was last seen as her baseline, independently mobile, about 36 hours prior to admission. Her previous medical history include arterial hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, obesity, and excess smoker. So there is a lot of risk factor. Neurological examination says dense right-sided weakness it's zero out of five so it says total weakness uh, and there's complete aphasia so the lesion must be involving the left mca okay uh, and uh, the post head deviation and gaze deviation to the left okay so there must be some eye field involvement okay uh, we need to understand a fact quite well what is the fact if the patient is having gaze deviation towards the left side okay if the lesion is, is including the frontal lobe okay 
or uh, the if the lesion is involving the frontal lobe or the frontal eye field okay the if there is a damage to the frontal eye field what is the role of frontal eye field frontal eye field helps to see the opposite vision of the eye okay if you want to involve the right frontal eye field okay the function of the right frontal eye field is to see the left okay if the right frontal eye field is working our conjugate eye deviation should be in the left it's opposite direction so if there is any lesion involving the frontal eye field, the eye should move towards the site of lesion, okay? So the patient is having conjugate gaze deviation. As we can see, the eye deviation forced and gaze deviation to left. So the patient is having right-sided weakness, the lesion in the left side, okay? As we can say, if the lesion is a frontal eye field, the, if the frontal eye field is damaged, the eye deviation will be towards the site of lesion. So... The eye deviation is also in the left, so it's also involving the left side of the lesion. So the lesion in the left, so that's why force side deviation to the left, the weakness is on the opposite side because the corticospinal tract will cross in the medulla. Okay, so the MRI, there's an extensive high density, high signal in the DW, low signal in the ADC sequence, high T2 image in the right M, left MCA area. Okay, so that's left MCA correspond with the force side deviation, correspond with the aphasia, correspond with the right sided weakness. Okay, so uh, clearly explain all, all of these facts as well. So the ECG is normal, carotid Doppler is normal, and total enter circulation stroke uh, is, uh, as we can say, stacks. Okay, so what is the most important measures to prevent the DVT and pulmonary embolism in this patient? So as we can see, it's, it's profile access, not the acute treatment. The patient is not having DVT or PE or pulmonary embolism, right? So in that case, I guess it's intermittent pneumatic compression as I clearly know the answer. Uh, as we can see, the clots, there's some study, the clots one and clots two, that whenever we did the clots one and clots two, there is no benefit in the no benefit in the thromboembolic deterrent, okay? So, uh, preventing the venous thromboembolism or any improving fun functional outcome. So, at that time, the graduate compression stockings is not having no benefit. But in clot 3 shows that the intermittent pneumatic compression involving the venous territory, so it's its first 30 days having a greater outcome in preventing the DVT. So, intermittent pneumatic compression on the basis of clot 3 for preventing DVT or pulmonary embolism should be applied. Now, the next question is a, it's a data and so painful data. Uh, so, a 70 years old retired brass diaphragm presents with left acute, uh, acute left-sided sensory loss involving the face and arms. So, there is left-sided, also there is left-sided facial droop. So, the lesion could be involving the, I guess, internal capsule. Mm. And uh, at the time, the ambulance arrived, it's a lacunar stroke, most likely. Uh, and uh, at the time of the ambulance arrives, eight minutes later, the symptoms is resolved. So, it's not a stroke, it's TIA. So, what is the chance of recurrency in TIA? Okay. So, I, I go to, just go to the answer. There is a you know, some project and some study ongoing that they estimated the risk of following TIA after one year. They say that a significant risk is after uh, 365 days is about 5.1% respectively, okay? 90 days involving 3.7%. So I guess there's lots of data. So uh, uh, as an answer, after one year, the risk is 5%, okay? Next question. The 36 years old man referred to high risk TIA clinic. She has a history or oh, he has a history of migraine aura. On question, you have additionally established that patient has had a several TIAs in the past. So there's TIA, migraine and aura. Click in mind. So the diagnosis, the father is also having migraine with aura and TIA. So I guess the diagnosis is quite well. And the father is also having dementia as a inappropriate and uh, also died from pneumonia. So I guess the family history of migraine, family history of TIA with cognitive impairment is cerebral, autosomal, dominant, scadacy. Okay. So cerebral, autosomal, dominant, arteriopathy, subcortical infarct and leukoencephalopathy is autosomal dominant disorder. So it's most likely the, most likely the transmission for this disorder okay it's a high penetrance so there must be a family history there must be must be must be a family history unless otherwise it is obscured or the patient is having you know uh, it's uh, it's adopted child 
Okay, so it's a mutation in the notch trigene uh, involving the chromosome 19. So if we do a MRI in this patient, we'll get a deep white matter changes uh, that concentrated in the basal ganglia, periventricular white matter in the pons. Okay, sometimes the basal ganglia or uh, periventricular white matter or something they may extend to the external capsular or temporal lobes. Okay, now. Now, next question. The which one of the following disorder is not by a CAG repeat mutation? So there is a lot of disorder, uh, lot of disorder which is uh, having the trinucleotide repeat disorder. So only one thing I guess it is the Friedreich ataxia. As I can, uh, as we should remember, it's a, a GAA mutation. Okay, so. Uh, the Huntington or Huntington disease like or, or the spinocerebral ataxia or Macado Joseph or dentatorubral peridolution atrophy, all of this condition having a uh, CAG mutation, typical CAG mutation. As you can see, the Friedreich ataxia autosomal recessive disorder caused by GAA in the frataxin gene in 95% of cases. Okay, protection is involving the 95% of the cases. Now, question number 10. Uh, if the Parkinson is having uh, there's a family of Parkinson's syndrome, I guess. The brother is diagnosed for with Parkinson as 42. His father and paternal ankle has been diagnosed with Parkinson disease. So there's a family history, most likely autosomal dominant. So if uh, we want to establish that there's some rare possibility of having some park genes involving the Parkinsonism. So among the corresponding park gene, I guess it's part eight, which involving the leucine repeat kinase 2 receptor. So leucine rich repeat kinase LRRK2. So it's most likely LRRK2. Yes. The mutation is leucine rich repeat kinase 2 gene is the most common gene involving the both familial and sporadic Parkinson disease. It is responsible for 10% of the PD patient uh, apparent autosomal dominant. As you can see, autosomal dominant inheritance. All other mutation uh, having an autosomal recessive. So PARC9, PARC7, PARC6 or PARC2 all are involving and inherited as an autosomal recessive pattern. So let's go to question 11. Uh, a 22 years old uh, male in the clinic, progressive problem and the balance. So there is progressive ataxia. One of the his siblings has been diagnosed with Friedreich ataxia. So there is a, it's an autoreceptive condition, but the family history of Friedreich ataxia is confirmed by genetic testing. He wonders if he has same condition. Assuming he is also having Friedreich ataxia, which one of the following condition is most likely to be present here? So the most likely to be present here, as we can see in Friedreich ataxia, there is hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. So it's a, it's a common condition here. There could be diabetes mellitus, as we can see. There is Rizatria, most likely. There is Piscavas also present. So most likely to be present. It's the best answer. So best answer, I guess, it should be between, uh, I guess, it's Piscavas or Rizatria. Oh, it's a Rizatria. Okay, uh, Rizatria is a very important condition. As we can say, uh, the Fetus ataxia is an autosomal recessive condition, commonest inherited ataxia. And the main clinical feature are progressive gait and limb ataxia, absent lower limb reflexes, uh, extensor plantar responses, and also there's reduction and loss of vibration sense and proprioception. And the cardiomyopathy and scoliosis and food deformity are common. Diabetes is also common. That scoliosis is 60% to 80%, cardiomyopathy is 65%, and peace cavus is involving 75%. But dysarthria should be involving more than 90%. So the answer is. <coughs> Sorry for the interruption. A 20 a, a 28 years old man is seen in the outpatient clinic. Two weeks ago, he woke up several severe pain involving the right shoulder. Over the next few days, he noticed weakness involving the right arm, reduced sensation in four and five fingers in the right arm. Okay. So as you can see, he woke up. He woke up with severe pain involving the right shoulder. On the next day, he noticed weakness in the right arm, reduced sensation in the fourth and fifth days in the right arm. Four years ago, similar left shoulder uh, shoulder episode was resolved almost completely. His brother is also a similar episode. There is family history. Examination between hypotelorism, right side dead weakness of the deltoid, biceps, supraspinatus, right sided weakness of the shoulder, abduction, elbow flexion, elbow extension, extension of the fourth and fifth joints, 
sensation is reduced over the distribution of axillary and ulnar nerve. So there is a lot of nerve involvement and uh, the involvement particularly as I can see it's in the upper limb and the most important thing is there is pain. So if there is involvement having the pain, upper limb, multiple nerve involvement so i guess it's some sorts of you know familial neuropathy i guess uh, as you can see there's some disorder uh, the mp or pmp 22 most likely they are you know the cmts that means uh, the charcot mary tooth or hereditary sensory motor neuropathy but they are usually painless i guess it is hereditary neurologic amyotrophy uh, when sorry neuropathy hereditary neurologic neuropathy that's involving the sept uh, 19 i guess Yes, it is hereditary neurologic amyotrophy, amyotrophy involving the recurrent attacks of painful brachial plexopathy. There's other features. Sometimes, you know, the hypothyroidism, the cleft palate, it's autosomal dominant disorder involving the sept 9 gene. Okay. It's hereditary neurologic amyotrophy. Now, it's a disorder, uh, I guess, uh, as you can see, uh, the 64 years old man tremor progressive ataxia so for the time being if we get a scenario having okay if we get a scenario having the tremor and progressive ataxia one thing we should uh, re remember in mind there's a lot of disorder in the world that causes tremor with ataxia the one important disorder is fratax that means fragile x tremor ataxia syndrome okay now the MRI MRI shows that hyperintensity of both medial cerebral peduncles. Okay, that can present uh, CGG repeat expansion, <coughs> CG repeat expansion and pre-mutation in FMR. So I guess it's uh, uh, it's uh, fratax G, uh, fratax problem. Okay, so it's uh, ataxia telangiectasia with fragile X. Okay, so in this condition which one of the following having the most uh, severe learning difficulty the patient is having learning difficulty in uh, this syndrome so patient having the pops and the mom the father is having the disease mother is not having the disease so if this condition occur uh, which one having the similar uh, severe difficulties as you can see the pops have so we can see it's affected gene so x a y the x x okay so this is the baby, baby of female. So the female will be here, here, the female will be carrier, okay? So female will be carrier, but male will be normal. So he is absolutely, no oh, sorry, sorry. Here's male, not, uh, he's married with her. So I guess I close this. Now let's dig, in the, dig into the scenario again. As is XX, is X A Y okay? He uh, he is affected. He is absolutely she is absolutely normal okay. So he is affected. She is normal, and uh, the all the children of females they are going to be affect. They are going to be carrier okay. They are going to be carrier, but all the males will be normal. So he is absolutely normal because Y will be cross with the X. So X Y will be there. Whatever happens. Okay, so he will be normal, so it's closed. Now, this condition, she is carrier, so she is abs she is carrier. There's no doubt. Why? Because uh, because of that, it is x x a x. So she is carrier, and he is normal. Okay, so now there is two children. Uh, there could be a possibility of female. There could be a possibility of male. So in case of male, there is a fifty percent chance of being affected. So he could be affected in 50% of cases, okay? <clears throat> As he could be affected in 50% cases, it's a, it's, a, it's a disorder of anticipation. So whatever happened to him, he will be suffered more severely because they have genetic anticipation, okay? So it should be E. Fragile X tremor ataxia syndrome or uh, fat stacks, I, I said fratax. Okay, so uh, it's a neurodegenerative disease uh, which presents after 50 years of age and carries a pre mutation of GGG mutation. Okay, so it's a uh, it's usually presents after 50, carries a pre mutation of CGG. 
and uh, it's a repeat expansion of 55 to 200 in the fragile X mental retardation one gene. So FMR one gene, uh, it can be present in males, it can be present in females. Okay, there's some pre mutations on going on. Okay, the condition shows anticipation and um, uh, the fragile X syndrome occurs where the trinucleotide repeat is more than 200. So as you can see, if the trinucleotide repeat expansion is 55 to 200, there is uh, a fragile X associated with tremor ataxia syndrome and fragile X syndrome if the typical mutation is uh, more than 200, okay? This is the inherited intellectual disability. It's an excellent condition. So therefore, Proven's son will not carry a gene in the first, in the first place, okay? The daughter will be all the carriers with the pre-mutation, Okay, the daughter will be carrier in the pre-mutation and full mutation will, is not passed on by a father. Is of uh, the daughter's children have a 50% chance of having a mutation. Okay, uh, after two generations, likely to have expanded the full mutation and the intellectual disability is less common in female in the full mutation and also less severely affected by the male. Okay. So, now, next question, a 22 years old male has been seen in the clinic diagnosed with Baker muscular dystrophy two years ago. His wife currently pregnant, having already found that they are expecting a son and he carry, he wonders what chances of son to be affected in the same condition. There's no family history of Baker's muscular dystrophy with the wife's children. Okay, so wife is absolutely normal. There's no family history there, but the father is affected. So father is having the X, which is affected. The father is having the Y, which is absolutely normal. The while the normal while Y will go to the X, X having the female. Okay, so one thing we should keep in mind, a affected father will not transmit any of, <coughs> any of the affected gene to his son okay so in this condition all the sons all the sons in this condition all the sons will be absolutely normal but all the daughter will be if any daughter in happens in the future will be carrier okay so there's zero percent chance of having so it's extreme recessive disorder therefore male to male transmission is not absolutely possible okay you should you should remember this thing now this condition, uh, as you can see, uh, a it's it's a bit uh, difficult question. Uh, now the patient is having uh, a seventy two uh, a seventy three years old man referred to clinic with episodes uh, ringing, or there is hearing the sounds of typewriter in the left ear. He would hear the uh, typing getting progressively quicker. So there is some you know continuous typewriting like tuck 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 sound is ongoing, and uh, he would hear the typing uh, typing getting progressively quicker before it would suddenly stop. The attacks started three months ago and can happen on a daily basis, sometimes multiple times a day, and uh, they last for a ten to fifteen seconds and can be triggered by head turning or loud noise. Okay, so I guess it is a bit typewriter in it or something like that. Okay, uh, so I guess it should be a positive response to carbon uh, So typewriter tinnitus and it's a uh, parsimal scatter to tinnitus. Uh, so it's a parsimal scatter to tinnitus. It's an unilateral tinnitus. Unilateral tinnitus in which the patient describes the sound of a typewriter or machine gun or a Morse code. It should be caused by the neurovascular neurovascular compression of the vestibular cochlear nerve. So there could be some aspectum like vestibular paroxysmia. And when the tinnitus is the predominant symptom of uh, uh, typewriter tinnitus, the vertigo is the main feature of vestibular paroxysmia. So all of this condition can be having a head position or loud noise. They, are, uh, they, they may last typical of, you know, the, uh, I guess, the neurology types of headache. There are neurology types of problem. So it's uh, 10 to 20 seconds can happen the multiple times. The MRI can detect the compression, which is going to, you know, the spread of this impulse. And, uh, but it's low sensitivity, specificity for the condition. They quite wet response to carbamangipine. So vestibular, vestibular parsmia, type writer, tinnitus, all response to carbamangipine. Okay. So the next question is that, 
a 34 years old female presents to clinic complaining of constant swine sensation. Uh, she feels permanently off balance. It is started two weeks ago. She cannot think of a trigger. She went to a roller coaster ride with her son two weeks ago to celebrate the uh, celebrate his birthday, but felt fine when she came off it. So there is some roller coaster ride, and after the next day, she is feeling constant motion. She has been showing aversion to passive movement sense. So there is some problem after the rural coastal ride. Okay. So it's something like that, you know, whenever we're having a, you know, a certain, certain onset of any huge ride and uh, there is a lot of, you know, movement changes in our body and uh, we are having a constant motion since then. But the issue is that it's afterwards, not alongside, okay, alongside of the movement. And uh, she is now avoiding the traveling using a car or uh, using a lift. She's having all sorts of motions avoidance, okay? She has a background of episodic migraine, not getting any regular medications. So it, uh, it, is, uh, it could be a possibility of functional dizziness, but uh, having the rural coastal ride changes everything, okay? There could be another possibility of perineum fistula, if you any trauma, there's fluctuating vertigo, okay? The vestibular migraine, vestibular neuronitis should be having constant feature, having a respiratory, having an infection or any other condition. I think it's melt a... So I think it's a day bark women syndrome. I, that could be a more reasonable answer. So Malde bark. So Malde de bark women syndrome. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, which uh, literally means the sickness of the disembarkation uh, and a subjective feeling of the movement at rest following a passive movement. It is a characteristics of rocking or sawing. Typically follows a prolonged exposure to motion. Okay, and uh, there could be described after air travel, land travel, or motion game. It, it is the most important thing. Whenever we see a motion game, some patient uh, came to us having, you know, these types of mild bark women syndrome. And the other uh, features are including disorientation, posture instability, imbalance, and kinesophobia. This is a kinesophobia. That is the most important thing in this scenario. So there could be SSRI or vasodilatant that could be helpful in this condition. So the next question is that. A um, 24 years old man, emergency department, constraining, uh, complaining of dizziness. Two days uh, on ice skating and sudden shock. Okay. There's ice skating and sustaining a knock to the head. There is no loss of consciousness. He is frequently back up and uh, did not feel the need to seek any medical attention. After waking up the next day, ongoing dizziness. So there's some dizziness after injury. And the important thing is that when the pressure is applied to the left tragus, there is pressure sign. That means uh, she is uh, he is developing nausea and vertigo. Okay, so there could be a possibility of uh, it. It is not mal de bark women syndrome because there is a trauma. Okay, there is no constant motion like changes. Okay, second thing is that it is uh, not uh, post -con 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 concussion is not a possibility. Uh, it could be BPPV, but the issue is that uh, the trauma and there is the pressure changes causing nausea and particles. I think it's perilymph fistula. The perilymph or perilymphatic per fistula is an abnormal connection between the perilymph uh, space, fluid space. So perilymph uh, field space, fluid space in the inner ear or air field space in the middle ear. So the inner ear containing fluid, middle ear containing the air. So there could be leakage of uh, perilymph to the middle ear, which is caused by, you know, the headache or barotrauma. Sometimes they caused by the valsalva maneuver or otitis media, even in cholesteatoma. Okay. The perilymph fistula often causes ipsilateral hearing loss. And sometimes we are going to, you know, establish it by checking the, by checking the fistula test. Okay, whenever app uh, applying a positive or negative pressure to the intact tympanic membrane, the patient is having uh, onset of, you know, nystagmus or disequilibrium. So that could be a confirmatory test. Now, 72 years old man having a severe attack of vertigo. There's right-sided vertigo with, uh, there's vertigo with right-sided hearing loss, fullness in the right ear between this episode. During the previous attack, one week ago was milder. He managed to obtain an audiometric test. Uh, there is some hearing loss. So there is vertigo, there is fullness, 
if the vertigo or hearing loss having a fullness, we should think of Meniere's disease, okay? Last, and this fluctuation, the most important thing is that, uh, the last between two to three words after which he regains the normal function. The examination reveals spontaneous nystagmus in the right. So I guess it's a Meniere's disease. So the Meniere's disease is characterized by the presence of vertigo, tinnitus, or oral fullness, or hearing loss during the attack. It's a significant overlap between the vestibular migraine Okay, diagnosis of this condition is primarily based on clinical ground, a current or previous history of migraine, and the presence of symptoms with migraine, photophobia, phonophobia, and any aura. So, typical attack of this fluctuation of symptom, but the patient is having migraine with aura, photophobia, phonophobia, they may go towards the vestibular migraine. Okay, but audiometrically documented hearing loss during the and after an attack it strongly favors the diagnosis of Meniere's disease. Vestibular paroxysmia also associated with tinnitus and hypoacusis, but they tends to occur several times a day. So vestibular paroxysmia, they are having tinnitus or hypoacusis multiple times a day, just like a, you know, the trigeminal neuralgia type. You should give carbamogipin to see the response here. Second thing is that uh, if the patient is having the hearing loss after the attack, the fluctuating hearing loss, they more goes in favor of, uh, you know, the mini astrosis. The third thing is that if the history of migraine in the past with migraine, photophobia, phonophobia, and aura, they goes more in favor of vestibular migraine. Okay. So that's it from here, I guess. Thank you so much.